Hello. This is the Fight Back Podcast, hosted by exercise scientist Georgia Verry. Here, you'll find a series of honest conversations about martial arts and mental health. My guests and I explore the statement that every martial artist has heard. Martial arts saved me. How and why do combat sports save people? Listen to find out. Hey there, Conscious Combat Soul. What, you? Yes, I'm talking to you. If you listen to this podcast, then you are a human being who loves combat and wants to be conscious about the way that you're doing it. You're interested in being more trauma-informed, more inclusive, and more ethical in the way that you teach and participate in martial arts and combat sports. And that's why I would like to invite you specifically to join our new group, the Conscious Combat Club. We're on Facebook, and there's an emailing newsletter that you can sign up for, the details for both of which are in the show notes here. But now, let's get to today's episode. All right, everybody, welcome to the Fight Back podcast. I am here today with Samantha and Christina, who are the founders of A New Grip. Girls, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. One of you jump in, explain to everyone who hasn't heard, what is A New Grip? Um, Do you want to take it, Christina? Yeah, sure. Um, A New Grip is a nonprofit that Samantha and I had started to be able to help sexually exploited individuals and sex traffic survivors kind of take back their life and start a new chapter um, for their lives and finding their inner peace by using jiu-jitsu as a form of therapy and exercise to be able to get there on that next venture. (laughs) Which I love so much. So let's talk a little bit more about that and about the program. And then we'll talk about how you girls both got into jiu-jitsu personally. So what does that program look like? Do you give scholarships? Do you work with specific clubs? What are some of the details? So here I'm in St. Louis and Christine is actually in Pennsylvania. So I have to work with survivors here, uh, but we've partnered with Crisis Aid International here in St. Louis and Christina partnered with North Star Initiative in Pennsylvania. And we work with a couple of survivors. We do an introduction to jujitsu program. It's about a three day long class and we kind of just introduce them to basic jujitsu. And then thereafter they graduate and we have a continuing education course set up for them after if they want to continue their education for jujitsu. And ideally we would love to sponsor uh, an athlete once they leave their safe house um, and they go out into the world and do their own thing. We want to sponsor them and sign them up for a gym, pay for their gym membership, pay for their geese, all their equipment. So all they have to worry about is getting to the gym. Amazing. And what does those introductory classes look like in comparison to perhaps like a traditional introductory program to BJJ? Um, sorry, I thought you were going to take it, Christina. Oh. Um, so <laughs> uh, they're pretty basic. Uh, we here in St. Louis, we just started our second introduction class yesterday um, because we have three new survivors that we're working with. So we introduced that most of these survivors have never done jujitsu before, nor even know what jujitsu is. So we introduce them to things like break fall and the importance of, because when we teach them a takedown, we don't want them to stick their arm out and break their arm uh, or shrimping, which is also super important for escaping uh, mounts. And then it's just basic, basic jujitsu, the basic takedowns or shrimp escapes or stuff like that. And then the continuing education course is what we build off of from the introduction class. Amazing. And what have been some of the outcomes of the women who have gone through the introductory class and like onto the next steps? Um, overly uh, positive, especially for, I know that um, Samantha they and Samantha and Holly just started their, um, you know, continuing education program. But from the very start, it's been positive from, not only the actual advisors of these homes, but the survivors themselves. Um, I find that they get very excited. Um, The fact that we're only able to go like once or twice a month has been um, something that we're kind of trying to build off of and increase. But the thought of being able to do that for the survivors is exciting for them. They're completely engaged in the program, which is awesome because we were very unsure how it would uh, be accepted. So to be able to have Crisis Aid International and North Star Initiative be these 
two major hubs for these um, survivors and be so open-minded with our program has just been amazing from the start for us. Yeah, that's really, really incredible. And especially to get um, support from such big agencies, you know, because people do often misinterpret martial arts like jujitsu as being a negative thing for people to do. I know that some of my clients have spoken to judges and the judge says like, but isn't that the opposite of what you would want to be doing? Like, why would you do kickboxing? Why would you do fighting when you've just ex- escaped being in a violent situation? Um, so it's really cool to see people realizing how empowering that uh, martial arts like jujitsu can be. Absolutely. We've had some backlash uh, when we've reached out to a couple of other nonprofits in the area. Um, They've questioned our tactics and how it's beneficial and how it's going to help people heal their trauma. And we just try to educate them the best they can. And if they don't want to accept it, then we're on to the next. And that's how we got to where we are right now. Yeah, super important, right? Like you're probably going to hear some no's in this space. Like the the whole space of merging trauma healing with martial arts is so new and so foreign to so many people. It's not like trauma-sensitive yoga, all these things where people are like, oh, yeah, like it's established and it's, you know, it makes sense. I think a lot of people think martial arts make sense, but then a lot of people like you have both encountered are like, oh, um, we're not totally sure about that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> What made you both want to start this program? What was the impetus for it? Um, Actually, Samantha and I met uh, a few years ago in a jiu-jitsu class together. I was in Missouri and I had just moved there short term. And that's kind of how we became acquaintances. And then over time, um, just like friends on social media and so on and so forth. And then during COVID, we just really connected because of the increase in the amount of sex trafficking there was through the pandemic with the masks and all this other stuff, we were both bringing awareness on our social medias um, to it. And we just kind of connected one day and we're like, Hey, we're super passionate about bringing awareness to this, um, which is the real pandemic in my head. Um, And then we both love jujitsu. How can we connect the two? And it just kind of worked out. I mean, we, we, talked about it one day and all of a sudden two weeks later we had this baby that we had created together uh, for our nonprofit and it's just been literally just on the go since. Let's create a platform for that awareness now. Uh, what should folks around the world know about the sex trafficking situation and how has it been impacted by the pandemic? Because I don't think a lot of people are aware. I think with I think with what you're supposed to be looking for, people have this idea of human trafficking with what they see on social, uh, like the media and TV and movies. And they think it's some girl being swooped up in the street, some random person. And it's not, it's nothing like that at all. Most people being trafficked are being trafficked by people they know, or they're being groomed online over time. And they're starting off really young. And that's, probably one of the biggest enticements with the pandemic is people are being groomed because everybody is on social media, including kids and uh, their social medias aren't being monitored. And a lot of kids who aren't being accepted at home or their needs aren't being accepted at home, uh, predators online trying to meet those needs and make them feel accepted. And before you know it, that child is out in the world meeting that individual and bam, they're being sold and they're being transported across the United States somewhere. <clears throat> well, and then the what is the impact of the wearing of masks as part of that? Just harder to be able to identify these people. So they're able to um, not only take, you know, everybody up on these vulnerability, vulner, vulnerabilities that we're having with everybody being stuck inside and being on social media, like Samantha had said, but the fact that now that they have masks on, or if they are seen in public, it's a lot harder to be able to identify these people. And like Samantha said, they're sold and, and moved on so quickly in, you know, this, I don't know if what you want to call in this market that it's, it makes it harder to be able to track them down. Yeah. And I'm assuming it's, it's almost impossible to measure accurately, but do we have any statistics on how common this is? Um, 
there, I mean, it's re estimated roughly every year, 15 to 50,000 people are being trafficked. Um, that goes for women, children, and men. I mean, people think this is just women. It's, it's men too. There's, uh, there's different forms of trafficking. There's pimps and people, that's a real thing. You see that in the movies and they glam it up, but it's nothing like that. Uh, someone forces you to go out and have sex with somebody and they take all of your profit from it. That's pimping you out. And there are men getting pimped out by women. Women are pimping young boys and young men. So um, 15 to about 50,000 a year though. Which they and love. I think the top three states right now are Texas, California, and I cannot remember the other one, but those are the, at least two of the three top states in the United States for human trafficking. Wow. I, I assume other than, you know, looking at what your kids are doing online, um, you know, talking to them about who they're speaking to, maybe putting parental protections in place. Is there anything that parents can do that they can look for to help prevent their children becoming victims of sex trafficking? Um, I think getting more involved with the kids. Sorry, Christina. I think okay. being more involved in your children's social media presence, um, like you had said, putting restrictions on their phones. And we don't want to, obviously, people don't want a helicopter over their children. Mm -hmm. uh, they want their children to like them. People want their children to accept them. But it's 2022. We're living in a totally different world than we were 20 years ago. And I'm currently pregnant. I'm eight months pregnant. And I have a daughter that I'm getting ready to bring into the world. and. I already, her, her life's not going to be fun because of what I do for the nonprofit. I'm going to be that helicopter parent because I don't want her to be exposed to some of the predatorial behaviors going on on social media. So I think people really need to get more involved in what their children are doing online and monitor that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, really scary. But I think if we come back to some of the good works, I always do like to kind of look on, on the positive side. We're really lucky in society that we have people like the two of you who are like, all right, well, what's a creative, different way that we can look to approach this? Because not all therapy works for all people. You know, some people are going to really resonate with CBT. Some people like medication is going to be really helpful. Like it's, it's really quite varied and it's hard to be dogmatic and say like this one thing works for everyone. BJJ is not going to work for everyone, but it's going to be wonderful for some people. And, and that's a really, really fantastic thing. So I'm wondering as well, can you explain where the name A New Grip comes from, especially for people listening who maybe do striking and don't so much um, follow jujitsu and, and know much about it? So we kind of wanted it to be like a new beginning, but we wanted to tie the name into jujitsu. And the number one thing that you do in jujitsu uh, to do any kind of uh, moving forward in the in the game is to get grips. So we really wanted it to be able to identify using jujitsu to be able to start new and start fresh. So cool. I really, really love it. Uh, and now let's talk a bit more about each of you and how you got into doing jujitsu. So maybe let's start with Samantha. What made you start doing BJJ? <clears throat> well, I was going to college and I was getting a lot, uh, not a law enforcement, criminal justice degree. And I wanted to be in the FBI. And one of my instructors had told me, uh, being a female, one of my better chances of getting into the FBI was self-defense. So I looked at jujitsu and I joined a gym and I got bit by the jujitsu bug and the rest is history. And I've been training for about nine years now. Um, I had to take a year off of my training because I went to the police academy and I graduated the police academy. And now that I'm a full-time police officer, training is extremely hard. Uh, I work a lot and trying to get into the gym is just extremely difficult, but my shift and my focus has kind of changed with jujitsu. I used to train for more of a competition aspect. Now I'm training for keeping myself safe on the streets aspect. Um, and then with the new grip, I, my focus has just completely shifted towards the survivors and helping the survivors. So. Incredible. And what about you, Christina? Um, so mine started similar. I was in college as well. And I was just, I had, um, like a kind of a traumatic, uh, past experience and being on college campus, just kind of 
made me feel uneasy. And um, so I, that's when I was introduced to mixed martial arts and I saw, you know, Maisha Tate and every, all these girls in the cage and um, just how strong and empowering that they were. And I was like, I want to be like that. So I actually had um, dropped out of college and joined a mixed martial arts gym so I could kind of live this reality. And then um, my husband, I met him at the gym and he was the jujitsu coach there and he kind of got me into it. And just like Samantha, I, I did it one time and I absolutely fell in love with the mats and the ground game. Yeah, it's such a common thing. People are like, did it once and then it was like blink and it's just two years of training, like at least once, maybe twice a day, just like fully obsessed with trying to solve this puzzle, um, which I think is one of the really cool things about jujitsu. Even if you've come from a background of striking, there's always so many new things, so many new guards, so many new techniques to learn. Like it really is a never ending mind map of things to add into your web of neurons in your brain it's it's quite addictive for people and then I completely agree (laughs) um what makes you both feel like it's a beneficial thing for people's mental health for people coming out of sex trafficking what is it about jujitsu um that is so powerful Uh, for me personally, I think that it is very therapeutic and healing. I feel like it doesn't, for me, it didn't really matter what you had gone through. You get on the mats and you're able to roll and you're able to just feel empowered. You're able to use your body the way that you want it to be used. You're able to do positions and movements that you have control over. Um, and then being a woman who is able to, to do this, if you want to with men or older, uh, other women, Uh, or bigger opponents, it's very empowering for yourself to be able to, you know, get on the mats and, and just be able to do these moves and techniques, not only with somebody your size, but, you know, a bigger opponent as well. Yeah, I think the the bigger opponent thing is, is a big part of why it gets addictive like it's it's tough in the beginning but you can see what other people are doing but once you get to a point of you know starting to submit really really big opponents um albeit if they're like you know less experienced than you but still if they're on the street they're almost certainly going to be far less experienced than you is one of the most gratifying things I think as a woman to be like I can actually beat a man (laughs) and like that's a thing it definitely makes you feel like you could hold your own for sure I think jujitsu, it, the main thing with jujitsu is it teaches you not to panic. If you're in a difficult position, you have to keep your mind intact and you have to remain calm. And I mean, we hear it a thousand times. Jujitsu is like a game of chess. You have to work out and you have to play the game better than the other person. And I think that really helps keeping your mind intact and not losing focus on what's important during the match. And I think, I think jujitsu is the best precursor for if you can overcome the problems on the mat, then you can overcome anything that life throws at you because there is nothing more difficult than trying to shrimp out of a 200 pound guy sitting on your chest. Like that is the most difficult thing in the world to do. And I feel like if you can do that, then you can deal with any stress that life is going to be throwing at you. Yeah, I love that both of you and often on this podcast, people will allude to the more experience based elements of martial arts that have this transformative effect. And what I mean is that like it's it's important for sure to do mindset work, you know, to think positively, to reframe your thoughts, um, to do things of, of that nature. But it's hard to lie to yourself to an extent, like you kind of can, you know, like you can psych yourself up into like a thing, but over time, it's really difficult. Your, your brain, your body knows what you can and can't do. So when you have evidence like, oh, I just submitted a bigger opponent or, you know, I just submitted a man or, you know, I just escaped from amount of this person and you have this like shift in what you know to be true about yourself because you have new evidence. It's, it's kind of impossible then. I mean, some people still will, be, will find every reason to be like, oh, they weren't trying. Oh, you know, of course, there's caveats to everything. But the fact that we're doing something physical with our bodies means we get this like physical evidence for why there's been this shift. And it sticks, I think, so much better when you've got proof like that. 
I completely agree with that statement. Absolutely. What about, uh, we'll see if you guys have anything to add to this because they're quite similar. But uh, as I mentioned to you before, the question that I love to ask all of my guests relates to the central theme of this podcast, which is you often hear people saying things like BJJ saved my life, you know, and it doesn't have to be BJJ. It can be other combat sports, kickboxing, karate, you name it. But of course, in in our conversation, we're going to be specific to jujitsu today. So have you heard people say that? Why do you think that is for them? And then have you had any similar experiences for yourself? And why has it been for you? I've heard people say BJJ saved my life quite a bit. Um, I think they say it because it teaches you jujitsu in and of itself teaches you to persevere and face challenges and face the problem, not to turn away from the problem, take it head on. And I think a lot of people who've been through some things in their life may not have taken their challenges face on. Um, and it helps to stay committed to your goals. So, uh, that's just my perspective from other people, uh, with my life. I, wouldn't necessarily say it saved my life, but it definitely saved me in general. Uh, I did not have that much confidence growing up, uh, coming from a broken home, like the confidence just was not there. And I think jujitsu gave me a different sense of confidence that I otherwise would not have had if I didn't join uh, a gym. So for me, I think it just saved me. I wouldn't say it saved my life, but I think it saved me from myself. Yeah, I completely agree with what Samantha said about, you know, being able to give yourself confidence or through jujitsu gives you confidence. Um, It's a very humbling sport. You get out of it what you put into it. It's not something where you can just kind of show up and then just expect to be a black belt one day. You actually have to do the work to be able to get to that promotion. Um, and I, I think that's one thing that, you know, people really, really like about it because, you know, you go to work every single day and if you could work as hard as you want in, in that office job, but you're not guaranteed a promotion in jujitsu, you, if you put in that work, it's going to happen. Um, for some, it happens a lot faster than others, but at the end of the day, it's always based off of your work ethic for that sport. And for me, I think that's what is very valuable about it. Yeah, that comes up a lot, that kind of like structured progression, um, which is really interesting because on surface you wouldn't necessarily think like people want to have more structure, especially when, you know, really young like teenagers want less structure. You realise you get older, human beings, it's so important to have like a clear progression to see yourself improving in, in some way, right, that gives your life meaning, that gives your life purpose, that gives you feedback that you are going in the right direction as well too, because you can be improving, but you don't necessarily know, you know, um, and sometimes you can have improved a lot in jujitsu and you have no idea. And then your professor might, you know, be like, okay, you're, you're going to get promoted. You're like, what? And then other times it's, it's a, it's an intrinsic thing, right? You can feel, oh, I'm starting to, you know, do better in these positions. I'm starting to feel more confident. I'm starting to feel more comfortable. I'm less gassed. There's so many variations on that, like really obvious progression that I think is so, so valuable for people and that they they really can get access to through mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu and other martial arts. Jiu-jitsu is really cool because I think it has that quite um, intense combat side of it, you know, where you can roll to quite a high intensity without um, being at you know, huge risk of injury. There's always a risk of injury, but without being at huge risk of injury as opposed to like striking, um, but also then has like a grading system as well too, which some martial arts don't have. And whether or, and whether or not you agree with the grading system, I think it's really valuable to reward people who don't, don't necessarily ever want to compete, which is probably most people in the gym, to be honest. I think it definitely starts yeah. out that way. Definitely having, having a gym, a lot of the people, they just want to come in to, you know, learn something, learn how to defend themselves, lose some weight, something that's different than going and running on the treadmill. And then all of a sudden they, you know, they, they see themselves getting better. They see the progression and then they're like, Oh, you know what? I think I do want to try out the next competition. So it, it always really depends on that specific person, I think. Um, but I do believe like, when everybody starts, it's pretty much just to try something new or just to get in shape or just, 
just that. And then eventually on to competition. I mean, maybe there's some people that want to start right away, but um, I just think it's, it's a really, really cool sport because you could train on the mats, the same exact mats, doing the same exact technique as an elite athlete, as somebody who is a white belt that's just starting out. So it's really cool. Like you had said to see that progression, but also be able to train in one space with like a whole bunch of different bodies, just like a melting pot of personalities and, and people. Yeah, that's such a cool thing, right? Like how many sports do men and women train together? Very few, like the women's team and the men's team train together separately, you know, or how many sports do you get to integrate with people who are like 16 up until people who are like in their 70s and 80s who are still training? Like we we often are quite siloed into our cliques within, you know, our industries, whether that be why where you work or your family or people who are of a similar age to you. And you can learn so much from just getting into a space in, like I said, like a melting pot of all different bodies and personalities and, and people from different races, different backgrounds with different perspectives. It's maybe one of the only places now where, you know, people with different, different opinions are willing to sit together. And, and it might be because, you know, we're not really talking about opinions that much. We're not talking a great deal at least while we're training but at least you get that experience of being exposed to people who have different beliefs than you yeah definitely. I agree 100%. I think jujitsu doesn't jujitsu does not dis- discriminate against anybody and you make some of your best friends in life with the people that you train with on the mats because how many people in your life can you say that you choke each other out for fun like that's what you do for fun but all your other friends outside of jiu-jitsu, they don't get that. They don't understand like, oh, there's nothing better than going to the gym and getting choked out by my teammates. It's great. And people think you're crazy, but you, everyone who's been bitten by the bug gets it. So a hundred percent. It is such a difficult thing to explain to someone. I always kind of say it's like there's a certain uh, level of bond that you have to almost instantly forge, even with a new person who comes, you know, training, maybe visiting from another club or something like that. You have to trust them immediately that they are going to, for example, stop choking you when you tap, right? We put this like trust in them. And then that trust gets affirmed when we train with them and they do release off the tap. Like we don't even think about these things, but I think about why is that bond like so strong? Like what is so powerful about putting each other in almost bad positions and then releasing them over and over again or you know even sometimes like heaven forbid you try not to but like sometimes someone will go out from a choke which is very bad for their health but you know there's no one's going to get like really mad at you afterwards if that did happen sometimes it just happens accidentally you think you can work your way out of it and then next second you can't work your way out of it and I think that the bond with that because the amount of trust that you have to have to be able to do those things is like relationship building on steroids because it's in such a specific kind of container I like the way you said that relationship building on steroids (laughs) (laughs) I think so many people listening to this, particularly people in the States, uh, because it's quite location specific, the kind of work that you're doing, are going to be interested and want to help. So I want you to imagine you have like a magic wand and anything you want can come true. What would be next for a new group? Do you want to go, Christina? Um, just being able to get, you know, more people that want to be, in, involved in like the workshops itself. Um, it has to be very gender specific with the workshops that we're, we're doing for these survivors. So to be able to get, you know, more volunteers that would like to actually be a part of that. And, um, you know, being a volunteer in this kind of work, it's not easy. It's very time consuming. You have to make sure that you stay up with your trauma informed care. You have to, you know, make sure that you have some kind of knowledge or inclination, what that looks like moving forward. And um, you have to be able to put that time in consistently because these survivors are so used to, you know, um, very inconsistent lifestyles and they, they need to have some kind of um, support that they can count on. And so we just need to be able to have, you know, more people like Sam, Holly and I, and we've got a couple of other people coming on board now um, to be able to help these survivors move on and, and do, you know, continue their life in the progression that we want them to. To piggyback off of that, um, I think 
the biggest issue we've been having thus far, and we're trying to resolve it, um, feedback is always appreciated on this uh, problem, but it seems like a lot of people want to help, but when it actually comes time to putting in work, people don't want to put in work. People don't want to volunteer. Um, and like Christina had said, we need more volunteers, um, not specifically with working with the survivors, because uh, we only have a, a certain amount of people that can go into the survivor's safe house. And it's not like we're taking them out of the safe house and taking them to a gym. We're going to them mm -hmm. and in their territory where they're comfortable. So um, background checks are done by the organizations and training is done by the organizations. But we do have events every year to try to help raise money because we are purchasing geese for the survivors. We want to eventually sponsor them for their gyms if they decide to leave and want to start training. So the funds will run out eventually. So we try to have these huge events to try to raise money to continue with our mission of supporting them. So I would say we need volunteers. We want volunteers and we are like Christina had said, we have to be a little bit gender specific. Um, unfortunately, for now, maybe one day that will change. Um, I hope it will. But for now, volunteers and we would like more support and more people to come out to our events when we have them. Uh, we just had a black belt seminar in January where we had seven black belts teach technique over the course of two days. And it was an amazing event. We raised quite a bit of money at that event. So we're very happy with that. And Christina's getting ready to have one in Pennsylvania in July. So we'll put all the details for those events so that people can attend. You know, like there sounds like there are lots of tiers for ways that people could support with this kind of work. You know, it could be paying and attending a seminar. It could be donating money if you're you know, not nearby. It could be donating your time. It could be, um, you know, donating geese. A lot of people like buy geese so regularly and have geese that are like at a pretty decent standard that they don't wear anymore. Like, I'm going to put my hand up and say, like, the rotation seems to accelerate, you know. And so, like, at my gym, we try to give those geese to, you know, new women who are starting so that they can, you know, jump into the gi class and they don't feel like they have to only do no gi because they don't have a gi. Um, but maybe people could donate geese to you guys. I don't know if that's an option. Um, but one thing I was thinking as you were speaking is, like, so we're working to raise money so that, when women go through the basics and if they do decide like, yeah, they like this and they want to make this part of their life, they're going to need a gi and they're going to need a gym membership. Are you accepting sponsorships for one year gym memberships from local gyms? We actually just talked about this at our volunteer meeting today. Um, that's something we're going to be rolling out. We're not going to talk about it right now, but in the next couple of months, keep your eyes peeled and we'll have some details on that. Amazing. So people, uh, I guess, gym owners in particular who listen to this podcast looking for ways to become more trauma informed, I assume would kind of be like the perfect gyms to give these kind of uh, scholarships, because if they're listening to this podcast, then they are interested in teaching in a more compassionate, conscious way. So can they follow you guys on Instagram or do you have like an emailing list? How can people wait to put their hand up to say, I want to sponsor someone or wait to say, or put their hand up now and say, when you guys are ready for it, our gym is down to offer one or two or three or five scholarships. Yeah, we, um, they can follow us on Instagram, mess message us on Instagram or our email. It's team at a new grip BJJ.org. Um, we also have Facebook. So, I mean, we, we have uh, many ways for people to be able to contact us. Um, and we have, you know, specific people that actually monitor those daily. So that way nothing slips through the finger, our fingertips and things like that. Um, but yeah, definitely follow us, message, message us. It's not something that has to be waited on. If, if it's somebody's interested in volunteering or donating or sponsoring or anything like that, um, you know, definitely hit us up ASAP. And then it's something when it's at, when it's that time, then we know exactly who to contact firsthand for sure. Yeah. I think that's really good. I know a lot of people want to take action straight away. And if there's not an option for how to take action now, it can sometimes, you know, get forgotten about in, you know, the massive, all the things that come out in the world. And there are so many problems that we want to tackle and solve. So I think 
yeah, that's a really good advice for people to look in the show notes, find you guys on social media or email or, you know, whatever speaks to your preferred way of communication. And then they can get in contact with the team and say like, Hey, I'm interested. What is the next step? And, you know, get put on some sort of a list or, or donate now. Can people donate directly through your website if they want to? Yes, we have PayPal and Venmo. So you can do either or Um, we usually at the events, because of COVID we're trying to like restrict the cash income just so there's not handling of money and people can be safe and healthy that way. Um, But Venmo and PayPal and those details are on our Facebook, Instagram and our website as well. Awesome. And you mentioned the Pennsylvania seminar. Does that have a date on it yet? Um, It does. I believe it's the 23rd and 24th of July um, as of right now. Yeah, of course. It's always the way with planning events in in the new normal that we have. Um, so hopefully that one gets to go ahead. I think it seems like more and more events are going ahead as planned these days. At least they are here somewhat, although mm-hmm. it's, it's always very touch and go. But that'll be really, really exciting. Hopefully if there's any Pennsylvania-based listeners or anyone who's going to be in that kind of area, they can go and check out uh, that seminar they sound fantastic I kind of wish it I could go it's a little bit far. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as we wrap up towards the end of this interview I'm wondering if there's any messages that you would want to put out to particularly martial artists that's the typical listeners of this show um, any advice for you know if they encounter survivors or uh, life in general, maybe anyone who's on the fence for starting BJJ, if you imagine the listenership of this podcast, is there anything else you would want to say or is there anything else you want to talk about today? Um, I would like to let people who train jujitsu know, especially especially men, um, be conscientious, conscientious of who you're training with because you never know what somebody has been through, not even with training, just people in general, be conscientious of who you're dealing with in life because someone could have gone through something traumatic. They don't want you to know their story, but they are trying to better themselves and trying to improve their life. And they may not be able to do that in an intimidating environment. So it it goes without saying you should always make people feel welcomed when someone new comes into the gym, you should never uh, push them off to the side and make them feel like an outsider. I think just be very welcoming of everybody and be supportive of everybody who's taking this journey on. Yeah, definitely. And um, just to continue on with that, um, just patient as well. Like Samantha had said, you never know what somebody has gone through and anybody who has gone through trauma always reacts differently in certain situations. It may be skittish, might be scared. It may be no frantic or um, angry. So you you just never know what type of person or, or what time of type of traumatic experience, if any, that anybody has dealt with. So, you know, um, being compassionate and patient uh, definitely is, would be helpful. Amazing. Thank you both so much for your time and coming on to share the incredible work that you're doing. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much for for having having us. us. Have you thought of something to be grateful for today? What was it? I'm grateful for the amazing women that train with me at the fight back project. I'm grateful for Nari and the beautiful song Shape Me heard at the beginning and end of every episode. And I'm grateful for you for listening to this show and helping martial arts keep saving lives. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to leave me a review to help more people find the show, that's a bonus. Nobody shapes me but me. Don't gotta tell you what my name is, I don't gotta explain it. Walk in the room, hear a boom erupting like I'm famous. I'm here shedding shells, I'm shameless. I fear nothing, no complacence. Walk to many tight ropes with no hope, so I became this poster they hold over all the heads of trauma holders. You don't need to know my history, I move boulders. Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders. No pretense of defense, move first like chess soldiers. This goes deeper than empowerment, cause huh, I'm the one to power it. 
physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring if i can't change the scenery at least i change the specters no longer isolated but elevated and selective darkest places become beautiful spaces this is where rage meets patience meets power meets gracious meets we're so glad you came in the feeling is contagious when you the walking impact of intended bad intentions when you the manifest enough collecting all they tensions you the soul and body hold it all and still remember but i'm a work in progress testament to all contenders forgot what it was like to have control over self forgot what it was like to be the one in charge forgot in my reflection i could see all my wealth forgot that with my bare hands i break all these bars barriers and obstacles they can't cage me they can't chronicle all my, all my experiences and reduce them to appearances when i was truly beaten gave myself clearances to fall down mess up and get myself back up i'm not looking for clovers because i don't believe in luck damn you were badass i heard them say it clearly why thank you very much i know now i'm not weary of what's next for me because i expect to see growth like i was planted watered fed and bloomed to be the positivity and accountability no one they won't step if I'm the agent of my agency. I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin. Boundaries, I know them well. Take a breath and meditate. Who is she? I know her well. Now I get to open gates. One, two, one, two. I don't need your permission. And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition to know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing. And everything I do, that's me making decisions. It's truly underrated the value of self worth. Forget that I was rich from the moment of my birth. A penny for my thoughts, no, really, you can't afford it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh? Oh.